Ha, g'day guys, back again. Okay, today we're talking about the People's Crusade. Not technically a crusade. So, let's take a little bit of a look. Councillor Claremont that's happened, we'll be talking about that in a separate video shortly. And the Pope has explained a very passionate plea to Christians to assist the Eastern Orthodox Church that was under persecution and threat from the Seljuk Turks. The Seljuk Turks were only fairly recent conversions to the Muslim faith and it's, it's a very interesting story. But you have a lot of people, tens of thousands of people, who were from modern day France, modern day Germany, modern day Italy, modern day England, modern day Spain, um, and some of the Scandinavian countries who I guess were very impatient, passionate Christians, but didn't really fit um, quite what the Pope was looking for. The Pope was after a noble warrior class, the very top echelons of society. Most knights were firstborn noble sons, and this is what the Pope was after. Now there is a reason for that, because they came under the Code of Chivalry. Now the Code of Chivalry um, does give very clear indications about how people are supposed to act both on campaign and in war. So, and how they were supposed to behave as a person. And yet, a lot of these people started to get very agitated. A lot of these people started to cluster together in groups and hearing about the, the persecution of the Eastern Orthodox Church saw for themselves an opportunity to create for themselves a new identity and a new sense of worth. These people were often poor, perhaps middle class, they were certainly not limited to that though and there's definite um, historical links to some numbers of knights and nobles and certainly men at arms and those kind of things who would have gone with this crusade, uh, if you want to call it that. Um, however, these groups started to band together and as they started to, to make the journey to the Holy Land, which would have taken them a year or so, um, they started to move through Europe and they, you know, these groups started to cluster together and grow in numbers and size. Now one of the people who led this cru crusade uh, was Peter the Hermit. We'll talk about him separately. Um, but he's a very interesting and charismatic person. Very much a firebrand. Um, supposedly small of stature, but very much a, um, a, a, a firebrand preacher. Someone who could motivate people very easily and very quickly and get people to do, you know, to do things. So there we go. Where these um, pilgrimages started to cross into Europe, into you know, modern day France and Germany, you started to hear big reports of looting and rioting. Um, you can imagine, these towns were only typically, you know, 400 or 500 people strong, and suddenly you had groups of thousands of people clustering through them, looking for provisions and money, weapons, equipment, horses, wagons and that kind of thing. And there was a lot of civil unrest as this this procession found its way through Europe. Um, undoubtedly, undoubtedly, this crusade was not sanctioned by the Pope, therefore technically not a crusade. But it is often called a crusade, so we'll just use that label in a fairly liberal sense. Once they had made the journey in towards the Byzantine Empire, Alexius, the commander of the Byzantines, uh, had heard about this weeks before and trying to stave off um, the rioting and the looting that was undoubtedly coming, he arranged for this, this group of people to be provisioned and equipped 
and accommodated uh, in Constantinople for a short time prior to sending them across the river, prior to crossing the Bosporus. Unfortunately for this crusade, their travels were very well heard of and their exploits were unfortunately the talk of everybody, traders, marketeers, and, and stories were getting around. The Sultan, um, who was leading the Muslim forces, also heard about them. And he had prepared and dispatched a large force of Seljuk Turks to meet them. This is a, a bizarre, almost, and tragic tale of tens of thousands, possibly as many as sort of 60, 70 thousand Christian pilgrims, essentially doing what the Pope had told them to do. To, to congregate together and to go onto an armed pilgrimage to the Holy Land to try to take on the Turks and to um, try to take back some of these Christian lands. And tragically, um, they met a very professional army. So you can imagine, to, to put this into context, this is like a, a, a group of rioters trying to fight, you know, modern day Delta Force or the SAS or, or something similar, the commandos, and there was only going to be one outcome. In those days, there was no interest really for the for the Turks to take prisoners. They couldn't really, they weren't interested in ransoming them. Um, it just didn't work that way, not for the Turks. So these people had no value anyway. They were, they were the poor, they were the destitute, they were... Um, not soldiers, not really, not certainly not many of them. There were some knights amongst them for sure, maybe out of that, that those thousands, there might have been 30, 40, 50 knights potentially. Uh, and, and out of that, there might have been, you know, 100, 120 squires. But this was no match for, for the 20 or 30,000 Seljuk Turks that came to meet them. And there was a massive slaughter. Now we don't know exactly where this occurred um, and we don't know how many survived. We do know, interestingly, that Peter the Hermit had actually returned to, to Constantinople um, to seek an audience with Alexia and to bargain for more provisions and more equipment and to better train his, his people for, for the task ahead. So perhaps they had met small elements of Muslim forces and already realised that they weren't up to the task. Unfortunately, as I say, this, this crusade was doomed for the start and hardly even set foot in the, into the Holy Land itself before it was um, destroyed outright. It was about another year before the proper first crusade actually arrived in the Holy Land and had remarkable success. Um, and we're going to talk about the first crusade properly in, um, in a, quite a big video that's coming up, but, but there we go. So that's really really the, the People's Crusade. There's not a whole lot to say about it. It was a large number of poor and, and lower class Christians from throughout Western Europe uh, had clustered together amongst uh, four or five leaders. We know um, Peter the Hermit was one of them, probably the most famous, and um, they, they finally managed to make it to the Holy Land after a lot of looting and rioting, but they, um, they came unstuck, I suppose, because they just weren't up to the task. And war is, war is a, a non-negotiable. War doesn't care what your religion is. War doesn't care um, what weapons you use. War doesn't care, um, you know, your culture, your religion, your color, whatever. War is about performance, um, commitment, skill. And, um, and these Christians just didn't match the highly professional army that they were up against and, uh, and consequently um, they met their fate. And it's a tragic shame, um, a bit of a bizarre story like I say. I, I think had, had the story played out slightly differently, had, um, had the, the Byzantines been willing to train them for a few months to equip them properly, to provision them properly, um, then you would have ended up with a with a crusader army um, that potentially could have been two or three hundred thousand strong um, and that would have been you know able to achieve results far beyond what the first crusade did and be able to properly properly address the issues 
um, and, and why the second crusade failed in some respects and certainly by the time you get to the third and fourth crusade you, there's no real gain for the Christians you're just constantly losing ground constantly losing uh, people alrighty guys uh, hope that's been a bit of an interesting insight into the people's crusade thank you so much for watching please like subscribe and share I'll catch you in my next video